Are you a leader, manager, entrepreneur, business owner, or knowledge worker? Are you leading people or wondering how to be a better leader in your own life and work? If you are, then you can be experimenting better. Welcome to The Experimental Leader, a podcast that takes a look at the ways leaders are experimenting in their own work. Hosted by Melanie Parrish, we dive into real-life conversations about how people might be using a scientist's mindset and experimenting in their work. Shift your leadership into something that works better. Join us on The Experimental Leader today. Hello, everyone. I'm Melanie Parrish, and I'm one of the co-hosts of The Experimental Leader podcast. Hi, Mel. Hi. Hi, I'm Mel Rutherford. I'm the other co-host. Well, uh, I'm super excited to be here today. And um, I was thinking, I went to the Collision Conference in Toronto a couple of weeks ago, and I went with our son. And our son is pretty sure, he's 18 years old, and he's pretty sure that he's hacked networking. So I've been thinking about that today. And I've been thinking about sort of in leadership, like, you know, what's the purpose of LinkedIn? What's the purpose of networking? What's the purpose of um, creating sort of collegial relationships with people that you don't see that often? And, um, and, and I'm thinking about him. It's such an obvious line because he's uh, starting computing and finance management at Waterloo in the in the fall. And so he knows he's going to have six co-ops over the next five years. So he's trying to create relationships so that he can get hired as a co-op student, which is actually pretty easy because people that that is such a clear um, sort of relationship. Like people are excited about co-op students um, and he's excited about them and all the possibilities. So that's so linear. But I was thinking about it for me and for my clients, like, you know, what does it mean to network um, as you get more senior in your career? Um, and so I've just been sort of pondering that. I don't have any brilliant um, answers other than connections are really useful for context, um, especially like when things go bad. Like if you're trying to um, create credibility, if you have a boss that doesn't work out well, or if you have um, something, you know, then you have connections and you never know who's going to join your organization or who's going to um, come into your circle where a connection might be really useful. Um, so that's just what I'm thinking about in my leadership today. What are you thinking about? Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting, Melanie. Um, I, I was just reflecting yesterday about net, networking seems like a lot of work when things are going well, but uh, when when things are not going well, that's when the, you notice that you've got your networks and you can really lean into your networks. Um, what I was thinking about this week was um, leadership across different domains. I've had a lot of leadership, leadership experience in... Uh, well, in academia now. Um, originally, a lot of my leadership training came from my religious community. Um, and I think the, 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 the best practices and the approach to leadership in academia and religious communities and even in government contrasts with business leadership. Because in, in academia and in, in a religious community, even in government, you're really there to serve the people you're leading and you can really lean into listening and, and hearing the values and hearing the goals and really organize your leadership around the goals of the people that you're leading. Whereas in contrast, in business, who are you you're serving? You're serving the, the, the owner or, or shareholders who really require you to create a profit. So you still want you still want to engage in a lot of listening and think about incentivizing, but you're not serving the people that you're leading. And and the reason that that contrast is important, I think, is because uh, if we're in academia or 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 another context, I think a lot of people where I am are reading leadership books that come out of business. And I think you just want to be aware of of uh, of that contrast. Like, I'm not here to make a profit. I'm here to listen to what people in my department want to be doing and then and then help facilitate uh, those goals and dreams. 
Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. And I've, you know, I've heard the term social profit, you know, applied to, you know, organizations that are um, trying to serve a common good as opposed to profit. So the profit isn't financial. It's social that, that um, there's social profit in some way. And I can see how academia is that. And I, I think that's really interesting. And in, in those organizations, often there's two people, two groups that you're serving. You're serving sort of the mission and you're also serving, you have the opportunity to serve the people that are working in your organization, to develop them, to grow them, to um, create positive careers for them, uh, which um, I think it's, I think it's a sad common, I, I think it's sad that we have decided as a society that uh, the most profit is the way to measure success in mm. business, especially if they're shareholders. Cause I think there's a, there's a middle ground where it's not, you can also serve the people that work in the organization. But I know that, um, that CEOs and boards often believe that the highest profit is what they serve. Uh, and I actually question that assumption a lot, but now we're getting super theoretical. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm super excited about our guests today. Um, we are really honored to have Chris Romulo. He's a retired Muay Thai champion. He's a youth empowerment speaker and author, and he's joining us through his champ up philosophy. Uh, Chris has transformed the lives of thousands of students teaching them mindfulness and determination. Get ready to be inspired as we delve into his incredible journey to learn how he empowers youth with his champions uprising curriculum. Welcome, Chris. We're so excited to have you on our show. Thank you, Mel. Yeah, thank you, Mel, for having me here. I'm honored. It's a pleasure. Yeah, so I'm super curious just to start out. Um, how are you experimenting in your life and work right now? How am I experimenting? So I would say through the 55 schools that I've spoken to over the past school year, uh, the experimental process of going in and, you know, uh, speaking and sharing my message, you know, you, you get to understand, you know, you guys are talking about leadership and what I've learned through uh, uh, doing my best as a leader is understanding, learning to understand the kids and understand what the challenges that they're going through and, and hearing, you know, questions from kids that are going through challenges and experimenting with, you know, understanding and how to respond to these challenges that they're going through through each and every presentation that I would deliver, you know, throughout the school year. So I would say that that is, you know, the the audience and the auditorium or even the gymnasium, any gymnasium that I've spoken in, that was the laboratory of of yeah. experimenting with the philosophy and the thoughts and how that resonates with the kids. Well, I think it's amazing because with 55 iterations and an audience as a feedback loop, that's almost a perfect experiment. Oh, um, absolutely. I'm guessing you found yourself responding. I know I respond as a speaker, you know, you get nods of heads and you start to do more of that and, you start to um, respond to the audience. So you improve through direct feedback, which is something that with our experiments, we so rarely get. We don't get people, you know, viewing them and giving us feedback on thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up, thumbs down all the time. So that's really interesting. Chris, Chris what does it mean to champ up? So my defi definition of champ up is that we are all champions. We are all in this fight of life. And the real fight is not against the things that are happening outside of us. The real fight is against what I call the seven dictators, right? The seven dictators of our emotions and our mind. And to champ up is to accept that challenge, right? To accept how you how you want to battle these dictators and and move on and, and persevere in life because it, it's, you know, 
talking to the kids and and having adults at these presentations, it's absolutely apparent that you know we all face these dictators and you know they don't you know what I like to tell the kids is they 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 don't go away. We don't we don't overpower them and get rid of them. We learn how to be aware of them and then when they show up we can make a choice or make a decision on how we want to respond. Can and, you and tell us about the seven dictators? Yeah, so I the seven dictators are self-doubt, fear, disappointment, hardship, confusion, our ego and our self-talk. Those are the dictators that try to control us on a daily even a minute by minute basis. Mm. And how did the kids respond when you tell them to champ up? I I mean they to to again like when whenever I hold a Q and A session afterwards, like the questions that I get are so profound. You know, um, actually there was one uh, specific example where we were talking about self doubt, and I always ask, you know, what what is self doubt? And this one uh, fifth or sixth grader had this profound answer of. Self-doubt is when you don't trust yourself, you know, coming from a fifth or sixth grader, that was just amazing to me. So the, the response is, is great. They're, they're obviously, they're thinking about what the, what the message is, you know, that it's not against the bullies, you know, all right, the physical aspect of bullying is, is detrimental, but obviously it's not just about the bully. It's about how we're internalizing situations that happen in school or in our lives. And they, I feel like they are internalizing it themselves and, and, and trying to understand it. And that, that is super gratifying. Mm. What does it mean to be a Muay Thai champion? Well, Muay Thai is uh, the national sport of Thailand. It's a form of kickboxing. And I got involved in that sport uh, pretty, you know, as, as far as its popularity here in the United States, I, I would say early on in the, in the 90s back in New York. And to be a champion of Muay Thai is, you know, one, one of the most amazing feelings in the world, considering, you know, how I grew up, where I, I was the scared and confused and kid that was full of self-doubt and fear and, and basically letting, you know, the dictators control me. So to be to to go through that journey of, you know, training and becoming an amateur and eventually becoming a professional, it was, uh, you know, the epitome of what it means to champ up, I believe. Mm. How do you walk well, down the street differently because of that experience? I would say, again, looking back on my childhood, I, I didn't have a lot of confidence. And now the confidence I have, it, it's, it's not, I wouldn't say it's overinflated confidence. I, I would call it confidence through competence meaning not just because I can uh, physically handle myself in a situation, but knowing that not only did I develop myself physically through the art and the training and the competing of Muay Thai, but mentally and spiritually, I've uh, developed uh, an internal strength that I can carry with me, you know, for as long as I live. So I would say, yeah, confidence through competence is it's what it's how I carry myself. Um, I'm wondering if there's a, if there's a specific, well, if, if champing up is, sorry, if, if is, is champing up a decision that somebody makes and is there, is there something, are there circumstances that are required before somebody can make that decision? So yeah, in my presentations, the way I help kids understand how to battle the dictators, I, I, talk about or I share the ABCs of deciding to live like a champion. And yeah, so I would say the ABCs, the A is accepting reality, accepting your reality. You know, we're all going to face challenges in our life and, you know, setbacks or hardships. But the main thing is to accept what we have in front of us and not wish that it would go away, but say, okay, how can I you know, how can I take one more step forward in my life, no matter what? 
So that would be the first part of the decision. The uh, second part, become your dream. And I know when I, there were times in my life where I didn't focus on my dream, things, you know, I, I made decisions that weren't the best for me. So when you can become your dream by deciding that you have one or, or understanding that you have one and envisioning that every single day, that's how you can become your dream and not let, the, again, the outside forces overpower us, right? So focusing on your dream, I, I call it, when, when you have a dream, I call it having that lighthouse on the shore. When you're out in the dark storm, you at least have that guiding force, you know, you know, leading you towards, you know, what you want is to find yourself coming out of that dark storm. So your dream can be your salvation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And C would be the, or the third part would be changing the way you think. Right. And they, they really get this because after uh, talking about mm -hmm. self-talk and how our thoughts dictate, uh, you know, whether it's destructive self-talk or constructive self-talk dictate our actions, when you understand how to change the way you think, that can that will be the the anchor in deciding how you want to move forward or how you want to decide to live as a champion. How do you think about things like racism, sexism, homophobia, you know, the the things that are sort of external pressures, um, marginalization, privilege as you put together your talks, as you work with kids? So in my opinion, uh, I would say those things are always going to be a part of humanity. And it, it's, you know, obviously we want to do our best as a society to curb and, and rid ourselves of, of, of injustices. But when it, what it all boils down to is, is our response. I, you know, I like to think of my philosophy based on uh, stoicism where we can't control the things outside of us. I mean, we can do our best to speak up and have a voice about the things that are happening, you know, the injustices that are happening outside of us. But when it all, all boils down to it, it's how are we going to internalize, think about, you know, change our thoughts in turn to change our thoughts and our feelings and emotions, which will lead to our actions. So, that's how I feel about the, the injustices of society. It, it's it's unfortunate, but you know the concept of fall seven times, stand up eight. We're we're go we're going to get knocked down. We are going to get knocked down in life multiple times, right? Whether whether it's racism, whether it's you know again any, any of those injustices that you mentioned, but it's how how can we decide to take one more step forward towards what we want in life. I, I have this feeling as, as you say, you get knocked down that you've had, you know, this experience as a, as a champion, you've been knocked down more than most. So it, it resonates differently for me when you say that as a metaphor, it's interesting. Yeah, I appreciate that. And yeah, definitely it's happened many times in training and in the ring, but you know, thinking about it, all it did, all, all those knockdowns or those setbacks, all it did was prepare me for the knockdowns of life, you know, and going into a lot of, you know, a lot of the presentations I gave over the past year, you know, we, we talked about, or we touched upon the, the setback of COVID-19 and what that did mm -hmm. to society and, and the world. And again, we, we had no control over that, you know, I mean, yes, we had control in a sense that, OK, we could, you know, do the things that were going to keep us safe as as individuals. But we had no control over what that virus was, you know, doing as you know what what viruses do. They just they spread. So it was up to us to say, OK, what can I do to make sure that I'm. I'm doing what's the best, what's the making the best decision for myself, my family and my community. I, I did some work with kids this year and one of the most profound sessions I had with them, uh, it was a sports team was talking about what they lost during COVID. Mm. 
And um, I think anyone who's working with university age kids, you know, those kids are coming up, coming out of high school, having had so many losses. And I think adults had ways to talk about it. And I'm not sure the kids had the, the skills or the forums or the relationships that were deep enough to talk about those losses in a really real way. Um, so I, I can almost get teary just thinking about that work of, you know, uh, we all had losses, but I know I process them pretty well and my clients process them really well with me and I got tired, but I, I didn't feel unprocessed by the end of it all. I, I knew what was happening. I knew what my emotions were, but I think the kids really didn't, it wasn't something we've taught kids to do. Uh, to process emotions over an event like that. I mean, I think we send therapists in if there's, you know, a tragedy in a school, but this was a societal happening. So we didn't, we didn't give them many resources to process those feelings. I, I completely agree with you. I, I, I would boil it down to uh, what, what we have, hopefully as adults, not every adult, but we have the emotional maturity. Right. And kids, unfortunately, don't have that maturity. But that I guess that's my mission to help them understand what. And the thing about the dictators, they, those are feelings and emotions, you know, self-doubt and fear and disappointment, you know, and if they can be aware of these things as early as possible, that might give them a better chance for when that hardship kicks in in life. And how can you know, how can you be vocal about it? How can you reach out? How can you say, oh, I need help? Because, you know, for me as a fighter, for a long time, I, I didn't ask for help. You know, with the fighter mentality, you think, okay, I can do this all on my own. I don't need help. All right, yes, you have coaches and training partners to help you, but the fighter mentality sometimes is restrictive. It's a fixed mindset. Like, I can figure this out on my own. But after I retired, I learned that the fighter mentality, it's its not perfect. It doesn't work for life necessarily in a way of reaching out for help, communicating that I have emotions that I need to express and I need to learn how to manage it and handle. So, yeah, I definitely agree that it's important that the youth have an outlet for their emotions and feelings in some way or shape or form. Chris, what's your what's your favorite age to work with? I would say the middle schoolers. And uh, when I go into a talk, I, I specifically, in my mind, I think about talking to the 14-year-old boy that I was, where I didn't have a father figure in my life. And I was, again, being controlled by these seven dictators. And so I go in there thinking, okay, there there's at least one you know, one kid in this audience who's feeling the way I used to feel. And if I can speak to that one, ch one kid and hopefully reach and connect with that kid, that's, you know, that's a mission, mission accomplished. What's your dream for the next couple of years? To uh, my, my dream is to be, a, you know, more uh, my outreach with the Champa message to reach out to middle schoolers, high schoolers. And eventually I actually had this thought earlier in the week, which was, you know, starting a nonprofit, a non-for-profit where I work with kids again, that are what I've termed uh, going through father trauma and who could be facing, you know, who, who potentially could be making decisions that are leading them down the, uh, the wrong, I don't like to say wrong, but leading them in a direction that's self-destructive. Mm -hmm. And I want to help those kids, you know, make sure that, you know, they're aware of the seven dictators, they can build values, they can, you know, understand that this is, you know, you know, if you're not, if you don't have a father figure in your life or a toxic father figure in your life, that, that, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It's not your fault. That's just an inf unfortunate circumstance, but there's a way around it because I, I said this uh, to somebody last week, uh, you know, because of what I went through, I should have been a statistic, 
right? Whether it was mm-hmm. in jail, dead, drugs, alcohol, whatever. I should I should have been one of those statistics, but luckily I didn't. I, I made some decisions that led me down a, a more constructive path. And I want to make sure that I'm that guy, that lighthouse for any other 14 year old or any, any other youth that might be, you know, lost. It's really, it's really inspiring um, what you're doing. Um, you have a book out as well. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, actually, that book is is more, uh, more of a memoir, and uh, I'm, I'm working on a second book right now, but uh, the book is called Champions Uprising, and I, I self-published that in 2017, and it's just a little bit more about my story, and and again, I would feel, I feel like anybody that would read it would definitely be inspired by the challenges, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, fighters, you know, talk about their accolades, but I, I really share and I get as vulnerable as possible about all the times that I've failed, but I was able to bounce back and still, you know, be here to talk to you guys. And where, where can people find that book? Uh, that book is on Amazon right now. Okay. That's great. Um, and where can people find you? So I'm on Instagram. Uh, it's Chris dot Romulo dot crom. I also have a website. Actually, I, I just uh, put up a quiz for anybody that would like to go to my website. It's chrisromulo.com uh, forward slash quiz. And it would help you uh, determine your champion archetype. And there are, th- I feel like there are three champion archetypes. And the quiz would actually, uh, the questions are based around the seven dictators. And it would determine whether you are an awakened champion a tenacious champion or an empowered champion. So yeah, you can definitely, uh, you can, I uh, would it'd be, I'd be grateful if you went there and checked that out and took the quiz. That's great. And where do you speak? Uh, right now uh, I've done most of my talks in Brooklyn and Queens, New York. I actually, uh, I live in Jersey now, so I'm looking to do more talks here in, uh, in my home state and I'm, I'm open to, you know, speaking at conferences and, you know, anywhere where I could potentially connect with the youth. Amazing. Thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been a pleasure to have you. And thanks for uh, talking with us in here. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. And and I love what you're doing with the experimental leader. I mean, it it is, I, I like to think of being a champion as being a leader right? A leader is, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. And if you can live your life as a champion, you are definitely a leader. Thanks so much for that. Thank you guys. If you'd like to get a digital copy of my book, The Experimental Leader, Be a New Kind of Boss to Cultivate an Organization of Innovators, you can go to www.com book.experimentalleader.com and you can get your very own copy for just $4.95. I want this book in your hands so I've made it really cost effective so that you can start reading it right away. Go now so you can get started today and start to systematically improve your own leadership. Uh, It was so great to have Chris here today and I love his idea of the seven dictators. I think it's so interesting. Um, I've done work a lot in coaching around just the voices that are in people's heads. And sometimes I think of it as the committee in your head, but I like the idea of the dictator um, and, and sort of silencing the dictator because you want to make sure you're driving your own ship as a leader. And, um, driving, steering, steering your own ship as a leader. Um, So I really love what he's up to helping youth. It's so important that we help our kids start to be the people they want to be um, in the world. It's been great being here with you today. Go experiment. Thank you for joining us on another episode of The Experimental Leader. We hope you have found value in today's episode because we're dedicated to helping you become the experimental leader you want to be. To access the show notes or learn more about working with Melanie, visit melanieparish.com. Go experiment.